God has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. everyone and welcome to Unapologetic. Today we are going to talk about how to get over your past. I have with me licensed professional counselor Jason Van Ruler and we're discussing generational curses, inherited addiction, how to heal hurt, how to confess sin, and ultimately how to change your story. Please help me welcome to the show Jason Van Ruler. Hi Jason. Hi Julia. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited you're here. Okay, we got to start out asking what we always do. What do you wish Christians would stop apologizing for? Yeah, I I think Christians could really take a break from apologizing for certain emotions, specifically emotions they feel are negative ones. I hear a lot of people feel like if I'm a really good Christian, I just don't experience these things. I don't feel this way. And so the refusal to feel some of these things actually gets us in more trouble than just owning it's how we're feeling. Okay, you're going to need to explain that. You and I are coming from the same place of professional counseling, but how does it more hurt someone to deny or not express their emotions? Yeah, because it's still there, right? So if I'm feeling angry, but I think about it through my lens of faith and I say, well, you know, if I were a better Christian, I wouldn't be angry right now that probably doesn't make me feel less angry, right? That Mm. just in like inserts a new dynamic into that. Whereas if we just said, I am angry and I'm owning that, but what do I do with it that honors my faith? That's totally different. Wait, I'm going to press you even more. 2.0. Okay, so we're angry and we're a Christian. Like, what do we do? What steps do we take to not sin, but still express? Yeah. How would I deal with this in a way that honors God? So that's a question I might ask a client is, okay, you're feeling angry. Obviously, that's telling you something. How might you deal with that anger in a way that honors your faith or honors God? And what would that look like? Okay, awesome. And of course, like the verse we use in Christian counseling is in Ephesians 4, which says, in your anger, do not sin, not it is a sin to be angry. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Okay. So I know your story, but I can't wait for people to hear it. Can you just share with us your story of faith and family and your testimony? Yeah. So um, like increasing amounts of people, uh, I come from a broken home. My parents divorced when I was eight. uh, And so there's just a lot of chaos and volatility. Um, And out of that, I experienced some things like trauma, abuse, and addiction. And so I came out of childhood doing that thing we do where we swear off everything we've come from, right? We say, I'm just never going to do all of those things. I'm never going to be this way. Um, And then funny enough, if we don't learn new ways to be, we just become that same person. And so I had this realization um, early on in my 20s that all the things I've been running from um, had really caught up to me. And in a lot of ways, the new way I was doing it was actually the old way. And so in those moments, I, I really got to this place of desperation where I just felt like I have a decision to make. Hmm. The decision is I can run from this stuff forever, right? And it'll catch me occasionally and I'll have to face it um, or I can face it. And about that time, I met someone, I met my wife uh, who uh, just loved me in a way that I'd never been loved before. Wow. Wow. And she was a person of faith, too. And so I would wrestled with God for a long time. Uh, but what it looked like for me was just kind of surrendering to, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I know I need to do it different. I, that's so interesting. I love that you shared that. For me, I get a little like, like my shoulders grow up. I'm a, a little, oh, like a check in my spirit. Whenever I hear, there's a very popular song out there right now, but it's basically just say the name. I'm going to go ahead and say it. People are like, I'm just going to claim newness or claim healing. Or if I just say Jesus's name, which of course there's power in, but that doesn't, I mean, if I just sit here and say Jesus's name, I don't immediately not struggle with sin or secrets or shame. So I think there's a question, we're going to say it, and I know people don't want to admit it, but I think a lot of people have questions. Like we have the Holy Spirit as Christians. We have the power of God. He can help us and heal us. So what are we missing? Why do 
people still struggle? Why are they still stuck? Yeah, I, I think a lot of times it comes down to willingness and and surrender, right? And those are really challenging things. And and I think to your point, um, saying it one time is a wonderful start, uh, but mm-hmm. healing requires us to say it many times. Hmm. And so being willing to engage in that process of many times is often what makes the difference. Can you just kind of give steps for if you have something you can't get over in your past or a current struggle? Like what should someone do if they're struggling presently or also, or with their past? Yeah, I think we need to start by just kind of owning the problem and the extent of the problem, because a lot of times we're not even honest with ourselves about it, right? We have a story that we tell ourselves about why we do it or what it is that's actually happening. And sometimes that's removed from the truth. And so really the beginning of that is telling the truth to ourselves. And I, and I think if we're faith people to praying to God about what the truth is, because it's in that moment that things really can start to change because we're dealing with what's really going on, not what we advertise is going on. Okay, so I know that you think the same way I do, um, but we need to invite people into our story. And that's something that's really mm-hmm. uncomfortable, especially if you've been burned before by a relationship or someone you confided in. Um But confession is so great. Having people that are close to you. I know for me, that was something I had to pray for. Like we've been in ministry our whole life. We've started over quite a few times. Like I just would ask God, please give me a safe person. Give me someone that I can share something with. And then we share with the teenagers all the time because my husband's a youth minister. If you don't want to give up the sin or the habit or whatever, we encourage them just to be honest and tell God, I don't want to give this up, but help me give it up. Help me want to give it up. I love how honest we can be with God. Okay. I want to ask your opinion on generational curses, inherited addiction, and just kind of being self-fulfilling prophecies, how that all plays out. Yeah. Well, I think those are challenging things. And, and oftentimes what happens is that we, we learn a way of being in our family, uh, which is the way they've been. And if some of that is really unhealthy or addictive, they may have learned that from their family. And so what happens is we start to see in generations that some of these negative things are really passed down because there's a certain way of doing things that actually makes it so that that happens. Not because they're cursed or destined. (laughs) No. And I think when we believe that we are, that that starts to make us feel pretty helpless in this situation. Out of that helplessness, we get really stuck. What do you think spiritually happens when we try to change our stories or change our family or patterns? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great opportunity for growth, but I think it's also uncomfortable, which is where a lot of people struggle, right? Is that I think sometimes we think if we're going to do the right thing, uh, that it'll feel amazing right away and the world will open up, the birds will chirp. And, and you know, I want that for everyone, but that's often a process, not an immediate thing. And so sometimes there's actually resistance and discomfort initially because it looks different. And so just kind of recognizing like that's part of the, the process is really helpful. One of my favorite verses is in Isaiah 43 and says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? So I just want to encourage anyone listening, our viewers and listeners. I mean, the Bible is just full of second acts and second chances and new storylines and just completely changing people um, and their stories. So you are not destined to failure or sin or a specific struggle. It can be more likely because of what's happened in your family, but there really is power, spiritual power from God, and He doesn't leave us to figure out life for ourselves. Okay, let's talk about your book. How do we know if we're stuck in our past? Yeah, well, we have circumstances, situations, events that just continue to happen, Hmm. um, and we kind of swear them off, or we do that thing where we say, man, I'm never going to do this again, and it just continues to happen is Mm -hmm. often the sign that there's a wound or some things that we need to deal with that's causing us to get stuck. I had a mentor one time, this is hilarious, and there was this person I was working with, this was like 10 years ago, they're driving me insane. And my mentor said, until you learn how to deal with them, this kind of person's going to keep coming in your life. And I was like, (laughs) <laughs> Did you just like cast us like prophesy? I was like, Thanks don't, a lot. I was yeah. like, don't say that to me. She was absolutely right. 
And it was three different people, same same issue, same name. So I don't know what happened there, but there was really truth to, like, you need to figure out how to get over this battle or this issue so we can move on with our life on to something else. But so if, things, if things keep happening, that's a sign. What else would be mm -hmm. a sign that you're stuck? Yeah, I think feeling that way, feeling helpless, you know, kind of like we talked about, if you find yourself feeling in that place of just stuckness or helplessness, that's an invitation to do some work. Um, and I just love what you say about like, if we don't do the work about certain things, we'll attract it. It's, it's kind of like, you know, if a bee flies by you, that's kind of uncomfortable. But if we swat at it, it's just going to keep coming. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the more we try to push this thing off, the more likely it is to come back and, and to actually cause us harm. And so what we want to do is change our relationship with it. In my experience, a lot of people are kind of unaware of patterns and problems until about 25. <laughs> do, you, do you have any like ways to see if you're having patterns? Maybe talk about attachment theory a little bit. Yeah. So I, I like to do a check-in with the clients, which is just kind of the four quadrants. So we check in, how are we doing? you know, with our faith, how are we doing emotionally, relationally, and physically? And if I'm not doing well there, why do I think that is, right? So that can be the start. And that's a weekly check-in I recommend, where we just even identify, if, I, if I'm not where I want to be, why do I suspect that is? Relationally, attachment has a lot to do with that, right? So if I'm having the same pattern in my dating relationships, or my marriage has a similar pattern, uh, that probably actually is a reference back to some attachment issues. And attachment issues are really just troubles that we had as a child attaching with our parents. Hmm. And so uh, if you have secure attachment, that that's the ideal, right? That's what everybody wants, which is to say, I'm okay on my own because I know I'm loved and cared for. So that's what we're all going for. Now, unfortunately, for whatever reason, not all of us get that, right? And so some of us get a parent who is really uh, not present or who is quick to leave. Um, and so what will happen is we can get these different attachment styles, one of which would be anxious attachment. And so what that says is, I don't actually know that I'll be cared for. I don't know that you'll come back, mom or dad. Um, and so I feel unsafe. And so my job is to try to control the situation to make sure I'm cared for. Hmm. Another attachment style would be an avoidant attachment style, which simply says, I actually don't count on my parents. I know they won't be coming back. I know I can't count on them. And so I will be wildly individualistic, right? I'll just do my own thing and not even make space for them. Uh, and then we have the, the last style, um, which is really a blend of avoidant and attachment, which is pretty chaotic. Um, and so this is a lot about not trusting our parents and being hurt by them. Hmm. And, and so that attachment style wants connection, but also is afraid of it. And so they might pursue someone and then when they get close, run away from them. Uh, okay. Well, now we all realize why we have certain issues. Um, one of the best things I heard about attachment one time and healing the parent relationship is you can heal as an adult. It's like there, it's change happens in the context of relationships. And I had some very, not with my parents, I had very unusual situations happen a few times as a child and it did impact me, but God healed it through friendships, through my marriage, through people, mentors I met later. So I just want everyone to hear, like, you're not going to be hurt forever. You can heal, but it does mean letting other people in and most of all, letting God in, which I think is one of the sweetest things I ever really worked on was realizing God cares about my heart and he cares what hurt me and we can tell him anything and he's still there. People that are really stuck in cycles or addiction or struggles, um, can you give some advice or steps to the family that loves them? Mm. Yeah, that's really And the difficult. friends that love them. But then also, like I, I was just talking to someone struggling with addiction and I said, hey, like it takes seven times in rehab before most people get sober. Like it's this is a process um, kind of speaking to that. We'll speak to that in a minute. So what do you have for parents, friends, people where we love people struggling? Yeah, I think, first of all, I, I see you. That's a really hard spot to be in. Right. It's really, really hard to watch someone we love do something that we, we know is hurting them or is sinful and just to continue to repeat that behavior. So that's a tough spot to be. 
I think the other thing is that it, it is really, you know, a process and there's no immediate change. I think we all want that. We all want them, like you said, just to make a declaration and things to be different. But to your point, it, it takes a while and it's really about them making a decision. And what we know even from research is that people who struggle with addiction, what they need most is healthy relationship. That That's really the thing that leads them out. And yeah. so as hard as that is, if we can be a healthy relationship for them to have, that's often the best we can do to help them. Are they supposed to always like be confronting the person struggling or trying to change? I mean, like, what's the balance in just still being their friend or parent or whatever and actually addressing issues, do you think? Yeah, well, I, I always tell people, I think we have two hands because we have one for grace and one for truth. And and so I think in this situation, it, it's just that, right? There's There's grace, which is, I know you're struggling, I want to be helpful. And then there's truth, which looks like accountability and, and being realistic about things. And so uh, that is a balance. It, it's hard to do perfectly, but that is the goal is to just kind of walk out somewhere in between those two, right? How, how do I show love and care, but also be honest about the situation? And the thing is, you want to be in their life because that's how you get to keep comforting them and have an influence and keep that connection going. Yeah. I was going to ask you this. Do you think that addiction is inherited? Do you think that we're destined to have certain psychological issues? Not necessarily. No, I, I think there are some things that uh, may, might predispose us to, to struggling with that, but I don't think they necessarily mean we have to. Um, I think, again, what we're kind of taught in the system we come from, that may set us up for some of those addictive behaviors. Uh, but if we can find some people who are healthy, it's not to say we can't get out of that. And, yeah. and so really, the thing I would want to communicate is, um, I do believe we can change. Like I tell people all the time, if I didn't, I would have a terrible job, right? Like, so would you, <laughs> it would be the worst job ever. It'd be like, this is so depressing. Uh, so I know people can change because I've changed and I've seen a lot of others. So while some of these things are difficult, they're not impossible. Um, we just need to find some people to walk this out with. And of course, actually, the sole issue of that is being forgiven for your sins by accepting Christ mm -hmm. as your savior. But what I found is like being in ministry, then a lot of times we don't talk about that later, like as a Christian in our life, still receiving, remembering that we're forgiven by God. And it's kind of like, oh, well, we know for salvation we're forgiven, but what about our daily life or mess ups? Um, I just want to encourage people to share what's going on, not with anyone, but with someone and to have a real moment to see if there's sin in your life. Is there a secret? Is there shame? And then I, I don't know if this is as true for guys as it is for girls. Self-talk and the stories that we tell ourselves. I mean, that is the biggest thing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like the story of your life could be, I met someone one time and they said every male in their family was gay. Like that was just like the story of their life. And they're like, I don't want to be. I was like, okay, well, tell yourself a new story. Like, um, can you talk about like how we can rewrite the stories we tell and about our lives? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I smile when you said just because um, it can seem very simple, right? Is, is well, right. Tell yourself something different. I, I think the challenge is sometimes those stories are supported by other people in our lives. Um, and so it's hard to break free from that. But, but truly, the questions that I ask people are, whose voice is that in your head telling you that story? Is that even your voice, right? Or is that something someone else told you? And then do you suspect God would tell you that? Is that the story God would have That's for you? That's exactly what and I do. Not, yeah. Yeah. And if not, why? Right? What's why? Why is your way better? I have so many questions for you. I saw that you like to talk about <laughs> safe people. How, yeah. Yeah. How do we know if someone's a safe person? Incrementally, we know incrementally. So, so I think the challenge is that um, we have to qualify people to be safe people. That's not to say we can't have relationships with lots of different people, but there are layers. And so not everyone is going to get access to the innermost layer because uh, maybe they don't want to, or they're not a safe person for that. So what I see people do, and you've probably seen people do this, is they say, well, now I want to be vulnerable and I want to be authentic. And I pick you. But they don't qualify that relationship at all. They just pick someone. And the danger with that is sometimes we don't know who to pick because we haven't really been able to identify that. We pick the wrong person and then we feel rejected. 
So what we do instead is we incrementally say, can, can I let a person in a little and what do they do with that? And if they do something healthy with that, can I let them in a little bit more? It's actually a process. Wow. That's a lot nicer than what I do. I'm just like, okay. I, you know, the practice and therapy where you ask someone how they perceive you. Well, anyway, that's something that we do a lot in counseling because that way you get some kind of reflection. You get feedback on how other people see you, um, which can be very good for struggles, personality, blind spots. Anyway, this was fascinating to me. I asked someone, there was someone in my life, I could not figure out the dynamic. It was just bizarre. I don't know. It was like push pull seemed very odd. And so I asked her, I said, how do you perceive me? And she said, guarded. And what I know about me is I'm not guarded at all. <laughs> I like to connect with people all the time. And so that let me know, I'm just giving this example, that let me know I didn't think she was safe. Because when we're safe, we self-express mm -hmm. and we share. And so that was cool. That was a neat thing to realize. But if you're around someone and you're not acting like yourself and you're not sharing and you're shut off, I mean, obviously that's not one of your people. Yeah. How many people are we supposed to have that we really share with and do life with? Yeah. I mean, I think that our circle could be large, but I think the people really in, in the immediate center of that, it's probably pretty small. Um, I talk to people a lot about it. It's kind of like if you go to a concert, uh, there's general admission, right? Anybody can sit anywhere they want. There's specified seats. And then there's the VIP in the box, right? And that the people who are in the box of your life are, are going to be, that's a small number. Um, and that's okay because that that's really special. There will be a lot of people in general admission. And so the trick is kind of identifying which place they fit. And that's not to say someone can't change over time and move up, but it is a process. And sometimes you look back and realize people you didn't expect were faithful friends and have absolutely you know, been there all the time. Um, okay, so are we supposed to address if people hurt us or if issues are bothering us? I mean, I just, I kind of was thinking about more the preventative side of this. We want to heal from our past, but we also don't want to act the same way where we keep getting stuck or keep struggling. Is there a way to live more free and just forgive quickly and not get so stuck on our mess ups? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think for us, we, we have to kind of understand where these wounds have come from and, and do some work to process those because, um, you know, otherwise those wounds, if we've got childhood wounds, for instance, or whatever those are, uh, they act kind of like a sunburn, right? So if you've ever had a sunburn and you wear a t-shirt and someone taps you on the back and you really recoil because it really hurts you, but they didn't see it. And so the first step is healing some of those things that keep us reactive because then once we've done that, we are less likely to react in major ways to little things, right? We can just mm -hmm. let that go. But as long as that's touching on something bigger, we're always going to have that level 10 re response to a level two event. So we're talking about probably confessing or sharing, forgiving, working through the emotions, and then kind of a new story. I think... Um, People kind of get confused on forgiveness. Like they think, okay, this has to be a once for all thing, or God gave me a verse for this. And then they end up maybe struggling or they're hurt again. I mean, have you seen it where people really, like how long does it take to feel better? How long does it take to get past a problem or a person, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that has a lot to do with how you deal with those feelings. So oftentimes what we do with hurt, unfortunately, is we do things that actually make us hurt worse, right? So we take mm. the pain we're already feeling it and then we kind of insulate it. We say, well, I'm just going to kind of keep this protected, which makes sense because if you ever had an injury, like you, you want to cover that up. Uh, but the reality mm. is, is that what we do with that and, and where we go, if we can do some healthy, positive things. So it's like, if I have ended a relationship and I'm very hurt from that, um, if I can pursue a deeper relationship with friends, if I can pursue deeper relationship at church, how we change that energy and what we do with that differently is really important. Okay. Talk to us about dating, dating, marriage. How does that affect our past stories, mistakes, and current relationship? Yeah. Ready? Okay. Go. Well, let me solve all that. Um, I, solve all the problems. I can do that. I, I am <laughs> totally willing and able. Um, I, I think the thing with dating is that what I see oftentimes is if we don't have a good understanding about 
where we've come from and, and what it is we think about different things, meaning how do you define love? Um, how do you define a healthy partner? What is, what is your ideal relationship look like? If we don't take time to actually identify what we're coming into it with, unfortunately, what happens is we either volunteer to accept someone else's views or we unknowingly and subconsciously kind of fall into this pattern of intense conflict because we want different things. And so the best thing you can do dating is to like literally sit down and just say like, what, what do I want it to look like? Who, who has loved me well? What, what would I want to replicate? What would I want to change? And how do I do that moving forward? And pathology attracts pathology, right? It's true. So if we're, if we're hurt, we're going to attract other hurting people. I heard something really interesting recently. It was, it was this article and it said that we actually don't marry our opposite. We marry someone a lot like us. We just don't realize it because the only thing that ever comes up is how we're different. It's true. And so that's something my, yeah, that's something my husband and I start just doing. It's kind of fun is realizing all the ways we're the same, but we're not going to sit there and be like, isn't it so cool that we both like to swim? Like that's <laughs> not going to come up, but it is good if we're focusing on what's like different so much. Yeah. And then uh, I thought this was cool too. Do you want to talk about... Um, uh, fantasy, uh, relationships, fantasy bond. Yeah. You want me to, well, you can, <laughs> it's yeah. so important. Yeah. 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 No, go ahead. Like, just talk about that for a second. Cause a lot of people don't know about that. Fantasy or trauma bonding. You mean like where we, yeah. Trauma together. bond with, yeah. yes. Yes. So you have the trauma bond with your parent and then you recreate it with your spouse. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it feels like what we've come from. Right. And, and so as much as we may or may not want that to happen, it's what we know. And so we sometimes are attracted to this person who's got a lot of those traits of a person we were hurt by. And what we subconsciously try to do is try to make it a different relationship. And it doesn't work. And so it's a real bummer. But the fantasy is there. And so what happens oftentimes is it's a really amazing white hot connection initially until we kind of realize like, oh, this is that relationship again. Um, and, and it's hard because if we haven't done our work, we bump into that, not really sure why. Okay, we're coming to an end. So I just want to say for my fellow friends and listeners who like to analyze and are now very concerned about their <laughs> uh, attachment theories and relationships, at the end of the day, God is sovereign and he's in control and he's going to help you heal and get where you need to go. So do not try to analyze the entire world. Uh, you're not powerful enough to mess up your story. But Jason, can you tell us how we can get your book, how to connect with you? Yeah, you can find me at jasonvr.com uh, and the book is on all major booksellers. And then on Instagram, I do uh, daily relationship tips and my username is jason.vanruler so you can find me there as well. And they're really good. I have to say, like those videos are good and short and sweet and very helpful. So check Jason out. Thanks for being on today. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Thanks for tuning in to Unapologetic. Remember that you can hear today's show at ptv.org slash Julia or wherever you get your podcasts.